Zen at the Sharp End. Welcome to the podcast about how to turn difficult people and relationships into your best teachers. I'm Mark West Maquette, a Zen Buddhist teacher, mindfulness teacher, and ex professional astronomer. This is a podcast to go along with my latest book, Zen and the Art of Dealing with Difficult People, which is out now and available to order in all the usual places. In each episode, we'll be exploring different varieties of people, relationships and situations that we find irritating, difficult or painful. Together with a number of Zen friends, I'll be discussing how the practices of Buddhism and mindfulness can help us see our difficult people as troublesome Buddhas, our greatest teachers. This podcast is sponsored by Zen Minded an online lifestyle store offering you the very best in Japanese craft, incense, and other Zen-inspired home goods. Check it out at www.zenminded.uk. Well, welcome, Pete. Uh, Thanks very much for being willing to come on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. Lovely to, uh, to check in. Um, I wonder if you perhaps could start us off by sort of giving us a bit of an intro to uh, how you came across Zen and your background in Zen, how you've been practicing. Yeah, it's a bit of a long one, really, because, well, the story is not that long, but I suppose I've been doing it for a while. Um, I I started, well, I came across Zen Ways back about 2012, I think, mm-hmm. around about then, and um, because I was looking for a mindfulness training. I was a yoga teacher at the time, but I wanted to to do some meditation training. And I remember because my wife opened up a, I don't know if it was a magazine or it was something online maybe, and and this Zen Ways training came up for um, for mindfulness. And she said, do it. Absolutely (laughs) straight ahead. She said, right, just do it. That's what you want to do. And I didn't know anything about Zen Ways at the time, and I certainly didn't know anything about Um, zen outside of the word but she seemed absolutely adamant about this so i thought Mm. right okay she's got quite a good nose for trends in you know yoga and trainings and things so so i uh i decided to to go for it and i went up to anam kara um up in um near inverness and that was how i got started that's how i met daizan and I was tremendously impressed by him. I was really kind of taken aback by him when I first met him. And it was one of those trainings when you left. And and I remember thinking to myself, this is what I want to do. You know, this is somebody that I want to um, learn from. And, And that's what started the ball rolling, really. And then really, when I say it's been a long time, what I mean by that is is that ever since then, I've put my shoulder to the wheel, um, but I make a kind of snail-like progress on the the path of Zen. So many people have been practicing a lot longer than I have, but um, it feels like a long time that I've been practicing. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Well, what do they say? Um, uh, a normal person ga- tries to gain something every day, but a wise person tries to lose something every day. So it's like we can just gently, gently lose a sense of getting anywhere. And maybe it's a good good place to be. I think this is, yeah, that makes me feel a lot better, Mark, actually. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I will agree with that for sure. So along that way, I mean, do you remember the first time where you came across the, the phrase troublesome Buddhas or, or maybe even the concept of a troublesome Buddha? It's funny because actually the first time really I came across, the, the first time that I can remember that I came across actually was probably in conversation with you, strangely enough. Um, it wasn't that long ago, really. Um, I suppose one of the things that, it clicked with me or something that it reminded me of was uh, on some of the yoga trainings that I'd been a part of. One of the teachings, which I always found really interesting was somebody saying to me that anybody really can be a saint on an ashram or anybody can be, you know, uh, the real deal when you're shut away on a lovely retreat setting. Right. Right. The minute you leave it and somebody gives you a parking ticket, 
you know, you're swearing at them, you're shouting at them, mm. and suddenly the whole thing just drops away. So I think that I'd heard before, and that really interested me. And then when you started talking about it, I thought that's a really great idea for a book, because this seems to me to be the very meat of what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Dizen said the other day? Um if we can't take what we find in our practice and apply it to daily life, then our practice is nothing more than just an eccentric hobby. <laughs> That's it. I mean, it really is it because, you know, you might as well take up, I don't know, battle reenactments or something <laughs> like that because for all the good it does you, because otherwise, I, and I think I've over the years felt that very acutely that there is a, or there certainly has been for a long time, a very big disconnect between you know what what we do maybe in inside these settings and then what we're actually able to put into practice in our daily life and and that seems to me to be the real challenge of all of this mm, mm, mm. yeah so so what what is a troublesome buddha to you then what what is that you know when i'm when i say that phrase what sort of what kind of things arise mm. a troublesome buddha for me is somebody who prompts my weak spots somebody who uh sets in motion the patterns of thought that make me feel bad oh. um so for example um one of the things which i've found particularly um troublesome i suppose over the last well 10 years however long 20 years uh, is jealousy Feelings of, oh, I'm just, everyone's doing better than me or everyone's getting ahead, this and that. And that is something which I've recognized that you, you can't run away from it because you can apply it to the job that you're doing. You can apply it to the friendship group you have. You can apply it to your Zen training. You can apply it to anything and it will show up in all of those settings, in somebody or in some group of people, and those are the troublesome Buddhas in my life. So these are the the particularly troublesome people for you. Those people that in that bring up jealousy and envy in you. They've been they've been the sort of um, focus point for your troublesome Buddha explorations. I would say that they've certainly been. Um... I've begun more and more to recognize them as that and realizing that part of you is or looks forward to, no, not perhaps looks forward to, but part of you enjoys the feeling of actually allowing that anger to take hold. It's like there's a row coming here and it would take such an effort for me not to allow it to happen. Whereas it would feel really good just to, you know, get into this right? and recognizing that that actually is a road to a whole lot of trouble. And that I think is, a, is another part of, of what, how the troublesome Buddha shows up is that like, there's that part of you that really wants to engage and get angry and go yeah. go for it. Um, and that's a real challenge. It's like you're being, it's like a lure, isn't it? You, you sometimes feel like you're being drawn in or sort of funneled into this um, explosivity or, or the kind of, um, I don't know, it's kind of the combustibleness <laughs> yeah and there's something really like delicious in in a sense yes. about, about getting into that it, it, i can I give you a perfect example actually yeah. um it was um not that long ago um i was I, i'll keep it brief but i was i was in in the car with my son and i i was waiting at I'd stopped at a T junction for what must have been all of about 10 seconds. And then this car behind me starts honking at me. And I thought, I can't go anywhere. There's, there's, I'm on a T junction, there's cars in front of me. And at that exact moment, something inside me yielded to the, to the anger. And so I just turned the car off and I sat there with my arms folded and 
was essentially saying, okay, if you're going to be like that, I'm going to be like this. And, and I waved out the window to let this guy know that this was what I was doing. Now, of course, this is the most childish thing in the world. But at that time, it felt so good to do that. Now, of course, I drove over finally over the thing after he'd honked and sworn at me a lot. And then the moment we got over, he swung his car around in front of me and was about to get out of the car. And there was lots wow. of effing and blinding going on. All the while, my son is, is you know, sitting there in the, in the seat, yeah. bewildered, essentially. And it blew over. Nothing happened. Nobody got out of the cars. No, and no crowbars this time. No crowbars. No, 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 nothing physical. But I got home and, and once the, 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 you know, the blood pressure had dropped, I thought, what a dreadful example have I just set there? I mean, oh. I, I spoke to him about it afterwards and we were laughing about your, your it. son. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. saw the funny side of this, but yeah. what happens is I remember Dizan said this many times to me and I'm sure to you as well. Enlightened action leaves no wake. Mm. And this was a perfect example of an unenlightened action because in actual fact, I felt terribly guilty about it. I shouldn't have done it. I felt like a bad father. I just felt as though I'd let myself down in many ways. Mm. And so it actually obsessed me for a few days afterwards. And in the moment, it felt so good to give into it. But afterwards, I paid for it in spades. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so so what was then, what was happening in those days afterwards? Like, how did you approach that and practice with it yeah well i realized that my action in the moment had consequences consequences for for me consequences possibly for my son consequences for the other person in the car none yeah. of which were particularly positive and you then reflect on what you did and realize that the the strong magnetic pull of that emotion, the want to get even or to prove yourself right in that moment, it hijacks you. It, it takes control over you. And I'm not someone I would consider as a very angry person. I'm a mm. fairly laid back sort of individual as far as anger is concerned. But something about this just really pushed my buttons. And with perspective, you see why it is that there's a better way of dealing with this because had I just you know let it go and not let it bother me I could have driven on and I would have forgotten about it moments yeah. after but yeah. in actual fact hours were spent essentially beating myself up about it mm, mm, mm. yeah mm. so we come to the realization that we could have done something different we mm. could have just let it go and and the consequences of the the direct consequences of um the, how the person responded to you but also how you then spent the next days trying to deal with it mm -hmm. um could you say a little bit more about how how you actually so we we realize that and then and then what you know like we sort of see okay i could have could have done something differently but was there a sort of were there any follow ons? Or I mean, do, do you think, oh, I could have, next time this happens, or, you know? Next time I'll make sure I've got my kosh in the back of the car. <laughs> 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 no, no, I, I tell you what, it actually struck me. It's one of those, I suppose, we have emotional hotspots, don't we? There are certain yeah. memories which have a great resonance because they, you know, cause a shift in our thinking. And what it is is that when those potential moments start to show their face for example was that situation to arise again i would hope actually that i would act differently because mm. the memory of this is fairly fresh and it is a, rec a recognition of the fact that really your anger in that moment doesn't serve any positive purpose at all but it does require effort effort in that moment whatever that next moment may be yeah. not to react in that way and and for my money i suppose obviously we've got this idea of right effort within the 
eight limbs somewhere. Yeah. And, and for me, certainly, there is a, a tangible, not just mental, but there is a physical effort involved in moments like that. Mm. Mm. Can you, mm. you know, can you essentially remain grounded when things are f- coming apart around you? So, okay. So, I mean, for, for absolutely for sure. That's, that's, um, let, let's say your son says, dad, um, I saw what happened. Um, let's say, what would you, how, how do I, how do I stay grounded mm. you know, in these moments? If I want to put in effort, where does the effort go? Yeah. Well, the effort goes in the immediate. Let's just say, what do you do when you feel like you're about to, to flip out? Yeah. Um, obviously we have this idea of the the hara and we have this idea of the you know using the the body in many ways as as the anchor which is going to you know be there in that moment so the attention on the belly the attention on the leg mm. the attention on the breathing the the um real time awareness of the feeling of anger beginning to build in the body particularly in the throat i mean always for me if i'm about to really you know feel Mm. it it's always a lump in the throat it's like something's about to just crawl out of there um so if i was teaching my son about it i would be first of all be very aware that the body plays an enormous role here how you feel physically in that moment lets you know often what's about to happen and you have in it have a power in that moment to to redirect the outcome in many ways Mm. so so when we when we acknowledge when we feel and acknowledge what's arising in our body that gives us the option to then change what we do next right yeah yeah Mm. this is i mean again from my own or from my own experience it is quite um i wouldn't say subjective but i would say that i think different people deal with this in different ways or react to this or or let's say um understand this teaching in different ways because certainly for me um i would i would say that it's taken me quite a while actually to 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 put the pieces together a little bit with that Mm. one um some people, I think, have uh, quite a lot of success by by noticing the changing in their breathing patterns at that time. Other people have more success, let's say, bringing some physical attention to the legs. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Or, um, t- tightness in the belly or jaw or something like that. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's it's a you learn on the, on the in your own way with it you find what is it that for you indicates that i am grounded and what is it that indicates that i'm about to actually you know come free of the moorings yeah and i think i think different people do feel it in different ways um i'm much more conscious of how i feel when i am grounded than i have been in 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 the past i certainly Mm. don't know that so okay, yeah. So that that's really interesting. That there's something there about getting more and more familiar, yes, uh, with and practicing the art of being grounded and staying grounded and being familiar with the feeling of what it is to be grounded. So that yes. then we 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 know when we start, we even like subtly shift away yes. from that, even the smallest amount. Yes, yes, that's exactly mm-hmm. it. It's exactly that, and and you start to um, recognize perhaps or realize maybe that the feeling of not being grounded doesn't feel quite right you feel Mm. i would say a lesser version of yourself if Mm. that's one way of putting it that's how it feels to me anyway you feel um i guess more anxious you feel more subject to being uh pulled into things whereas when you feel grounded you feel really that you can handle anything i guess Mm. that's it's the it's it's a sliding scale you know it's it's not just an on-off binary kind that's right and uh, and the way you describe that just as you said it would perhaps also 
it, for me, describe what it's like when we do get sucked in, we get lured into that. Yeah. Like it, it's very tempting and it feels kind of good. But in the end, we like, uh, yeah, that describes me. I feel a kind of lesser version of ourselves yeah. when we do react and, and, and say those horrible things or, or whatever it is. Yeah. And I, I think that, well, I would like to think anyway, that one of the big changes that I've, I've noticed, and it's taken time, it's definitely not a, mm. you know, overnight kind of thing that, that I'd like to think that I've become more aware of the harm that I can potentially do to other people and how it can affect them. Um, I think when you're in your teens, in your 20s, or certainly in, in my case, you know, you're, you're fairly self-obsessed and, you know, you're out for, a, for fun and a good time. And, and, you know, it's not that you're a, an evil person, but perhaps you, you have the spotlight is firmly on you. Right. Um, and I, I do think that there's more of an awareness of um, how's that person going to feel when they get home at night after what you said to them? That sort of thing. Um, I, I, one of the, the big, I try to, you know, live by this one is that talking about people behind their back in a way which is negative, that is something which I've, I've really tried to eradicate from my life because how would it feel if you heard somebody doing that about you? Yeah. And that's a really, I think that's one of the changes that I've tried to, to instill, which is part of this, I guess. Mm, 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 mm. So uh, I wonder, um, you mentioned before that one of your, the biggest areas of troublesome Buddha's, you know, troublesomeness is around the feelings of jealousy and envy. Um, yeah. So I wonder if the you, you feel there's a difference in how you would approach a situation where you start to feel the beginnings of jealousy arising compared to that example you just gave of, of the, where the, the, the feelings of anger begins to arise. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I guess I'm not an artist. I, I I'm no good with paints, anything like that, but I guess they're different colors of a paint of a paint tin really, because mm -hmm. Jealousy has a tremendously, um, almost like a, a sickness. There is a feeling of, a feeling of collapse as though, oh my God, you know, this, I, I might well just give up, throw my hands in the air. There's a real feeling of despondency comes with it, which mm. leeches all of your energy and makes you feel... Um, inferior you feel oh boy you know I'm never going to get on with this and that that's a certain color let's say that's a right. know, a dark purple color but then you have a anger which has a certain is a different quality to it so right. I, I've I wasn't someone who was ever into martial arts when I was younger but as I got a bit older I got into into boxing which I I really enjoy and um there is a certain enjoyment of channeled anger in mm. that sport where it's almost a positive thing. Let's say you're on a bag or something like that. It's a wonderfully enjoyable thing. Um, but it doesn't have the same feeling of collapse, even like anger at the man in the you know road rage incident. Yeah. It doesn't have the same downward pull. I see. It has much more of a, um, it, it yes it can make you feel bad afterwards but it doesn't have the same wall encompassing kind of collapsing house feel to it you know um and and it doesn't seem also to have the there's a there's a positive side to anger um in, in some respects which it, you know the i was talking about the you know the workout side of working with anger like doing weights or doing mm. things like that there's a sort mm. of power in it mm. Mm. which doesn't seem to be the case it doesn't feel like that with mm. jealousy yeah interesting isn't it like anger can be more a uh, kind of fierce protection yes like um um compassion even maybe can be mm. you know you can take that anger and as you say like channel it that way but yeah i wonder if perhaps jealousy there isn't an equivalent it, it's funny because i i 
I can't remember where I read this, but I I, I really like this. Um, and and please, if anybody is listening to this and and they happen to be a practicing Muslim, and I've got this wrong, then please do correct me <laughs> on this. But yeah. um, there was a, a I think it might have been Alain de Botton. He, he writes a lot about oh yeah, um, you know, taking all the good bits out of religion. You know, you don't have to be religious to enjoy mm. you mm. know the teachings of religion, but. I think one of the things he said, the great each religion has a great gift mm. which they can give. So um, I, th- I don't know if Christianity's was forgiveness, um, but he said Islam uh, was that what was a great thing about uh, the great gift of that was want what want for, for your brother what you want for yourself. And I thought that that was such a great thing because that really gets to the heart of it. It's like when you really do genuinely start to enjoy other people doing well, other people perhaps doing the thing that you wanted or, you know, doing this or that, that to me seems like a really wonderful way of looking at things. Want for your brother or your sister, what you want for yourself. And so that, I kind of like that. I think that that's important. Mm. So I guess in Buddhism, that would, that would be something like sympathetic joy. Yes, where, the old where one, the we're able, Viharas, yeah. One of the four Brahma Viharas, exactly, yeah. Mm. So we're, we're able to um, be happy for other people's success and happiness. It, it, it's. I remember the um, the retreat that was on. I wasn't on that retreat. It was one of the sessions, wasn't it? But I was watching the videos for it. And I remember Daisan saying that this is it. Is it? I always get it wrong. Is it Mudita, that one? It's one of the I four. Know. Yeah, <laughs> it's written in, yeah. <laughs> but it's that that is quite difficult, actually. You know, we we often say through gritted teeth, "Oh, I'm I'm really happy for that person," or this or that. Whereas secretly, we may be really struggling with it. And mm-hmm. I, I think that that's a wonderful thing to um, aspire to, and a wonderful thing actually to to start to cultivate in your life if possible yeah Mm -hmm. so and over the years how would you say what what's what's the sort of main way have you practiced with this sort of jealousy angle perspective Mm. or or what are the things that you've maybe what are the things that you've learned about how things work how you work how practice works that's two things i suppose really um The first one, I mean, I actually, um, my very first introduction to Buddhism, actually, now I think about it, I'd forgotten this when I said the first bit. I used to live in Bethnal Green, right opposite the London Buddhist Centre. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, I thought it looked like a nice place. So I just wandered in there on a lunchtime and they had lunchtime meditations. And they had, uh, on separate days, they would do the mindfulness of breathing on one day. And then the next day they would do um, the Metta Bhavna, which is the cultivation, isn't it, of love and kindness. Mm. And I always thought, I always found that tremendously difficult. I have to be Mm. honest, it's much harder than the mindfulness of breathing. But that is something which I've found really quite useful over the years, because if there's someone who really gets up my nose um, and there was one uh, estate agent once, who really got up my nose. They happened to be managing the property <laughs> I was in. And I, I'll i be honest, I was close to hating this person. Mm. And so every day I made a practice of doing this, directing this Metta Bhavna towards that person mm. because I thought this has got to be better than hating this person. At mm. least if I wish them well, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's got to be better. Um, and it did help. It did help. And and I found that if there are people who I really struggle with, that's the practice I will do. And if I've had a particularly bad day, I will think of that person. I'll bring them to mind and I will do this because I find that it helps. Mm. I find mm. it very useful. Mm. Mm. Well, I think it takes, I mean, it takes a, a, a certain strength of character, you know, to be able to say, I really dislike this person. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it right the way around, and I'm going to I'm going to wish them well and happiness and all that, because that that's quite something special, I think, to be able to do that. It's, 
I suppose it's you you start from the one the one thing where you think that okay well situation a is I hate this person and I'm unhappy about it that's clearly not working so let's 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 try situation b so this got to be better than this I mean I think uh, that's where it all starts but then gradually as you go along you start to actually open up and go well you know what this person might be like this for this reason and and you know this mm -hmm. is more about me and and mm -hmm. all of that stuff starts to come up so i think it maybe starts in rather as kind of self-serving kind of okay i just want to get out of this hole to actually starting to think you develop some perspective i think on what you're going through and what that person might be going through mm. and and your stance towards them can soften a little bit maybe yeah it does. Mm. It definitely does. And with this estate agent, what would happened? <laughs> well, this is the fun. Of, well, this is the strangest thing. I'm not making this up. I promise. Um, they just left. Oh, one, one day they just disappeared. I think they got a new job or what happened. But I, I did this for quite a few weeks, and then one day, um, I phoned up the office, and it was somebody completely different. I said, "Where is so and so?" And they said, "Oh, they've left." And I can't deny my heart did a little flutter and I thought life might be a bit easier now. I didn't wish this person ill, um, yeah. but it just, that's, yeah. it kind of happened like that. Mm. So yeah. who knows, who knows yeah. if the two are connected, but mm. it definitely, um, it definitely helped. Well, that's, I mean, some great like real life examples. Uh, I'm sure everyone can relate to, um, situations at the traffic light or in the, on the road. Everyone's got, you know, difficult estate agent, difficult um, shopkeepers, all sorts of things. They're, they're really, really very, like, every day grounded in real life. So thank you so much for being willing to share these and also share some of the, um, the things that you've learned and the processes that have gone on, you know, in understanding a bit of this. It's It was really, really fun, Mark. I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, it's nice to, to speak about it with you. And also because a conversation like this, in some respects also helps you know uh, me to, to develop some perspective on these things right. because it's only in these kind of settings that you you, you almost think about it in the in the broadest un of unpack it in all the little details <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah, no, i think i think it's it's really it seems to me like extremely worthwhile to to take if we really want to learn from some of these situations that come up in our life to actually reflect on it in a bit of detail and whether that happens through a conversation or whether that happens through writing about it journaling maybe or or, um, or any other way you know that feels like it's, it's kind of unpacking it somewhat it can be really um really enlightening yeah i agree i agree and and um thanks ever so much for having me on i really enjoyed it if you've enjoyed this podcast please leave a review and a star rating on whatever platform you use. And do recommend it to others, because we all have difficult people in our lives, and each of them offers us a real opportunity for learning and growth. For more information about my book and what else I offer, head over to my website, markwestmaquette.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>